Well, we now go to another part of the world for one more talk before we have a break. Um, my, uh, my father was from Norway. Our next speaker is uh, from Sweden, although he's really a traveler around the world, and I don't hold the fact that he's from Sweden against him at all. What I do hold against him, though, is the fact that he is not as aggressive or as pushy as, for example, um, Rob Levinsky. <laughs> Perhaps nobody is, but no, that's something else. Um, the reason I say that is that uh, he dug up something one day in, um, in Scandinavia, some beautiful heliodors, and I got the first look at them. He sent me three of those crystals, and I did not take any of them, uh, and I just wish he had pushed me. I wish he had told me, he said, Gene, you're an idiot for not taking those, because frankly, I was an idiot for not taking those. But he has gone all over the world. He also does work on, uh, on nuclear, for the nuclear uh, industry in Europe. Uh, world traveler, a good speaker, a good friend, Peter, talking about Pakistan. Thank you very much, Gene, for the introduction. Uh, I want to thank you all organizers, Jean, Rob, Monica, Kevin, for all the wonderful work. I've been here a couple of times before, and I must say the group of people is wonderful to communicate with, so I'm open all evening for questions after. I, my tendency is I want to show you as much as possible, so I will show you mountains, people, mining, crystals. But I try to um, show you the situation, as some previous speaker has done also, of the people. And most people here, when you go to Mineral Show, you see a few beautiful Pakistan aquamarines and you think they're plentiful. But in fact, I will mention it now, so you know it, in, just in Shigar Valley, 100,000 miners are working. Imagine you would put 100,000 miners in San Diego County. Let's, let's say just the Pala District. There will be tunnels everywhere and the production would of course increase. And I was there in San Diego County in 1987 the first time. Everybody told me, oh, it's finished here. Finished? Of course it's not finished. And you know what's been going on since then. Larson mined plenty of wonderful tourmaline since then. Now in Ocean View mine, they uh, mined plenty of uh, fine kunsites. And in Pakistan, the problem uh, currently is more the prices of dynamite. Since 9-11, they've gone up so much. So now many of the mines, in, in fact, barely working. I will try to give you a short introduction to this uh, region. And one thing, it's just there's such a huge cultural difference that, of course, you should do in Rome as Romans do, but it's not so easy for us to know everything about Pakistan. One of the first things, you don't sing or whistle. That is to attract women. If you would do that there, I, we would probably not see you here anymore. Those are one, one of the first things. And I used to, before I went to Pakistan first, I used to sing in the shower. Don't ever do that in Pakistan, no matter where you are. So there are many rules. You don't look at a woman at all. If somebody would introduce to, to the wife, you should not look in her direction. You should never touch her and so on. And those are very important to know. Number one rule in the Muslim world is there very, very, um, number one is to take care of a traveler. They must house a traveler to give him food. Number two is revenge. So if you did something that was not correct, you better be careful. So it's not that they're evil spirit or anything, this is just a tradition. So if you do some dirty business, and I will tell you one story that happened to me when I was there. Very good, so here is uh, the start. Uh, Northern Pakistan, we will speak about primarily the Karakoram, Hindu Kush, and the Himalaya Mountains, where most of the deposits are. This is K2 peak. And this is what some people don't realize. It's extremely high altitude, and the best mines are all situated over 14,000 feet. There's some down at the bottom of uh, Shigar Valley. So before my first trip in 1985, I had the first good contacts with a couple of dealers who came to the Munich show and the Pakistani gemological, uh, uh, there was a general from there that was selling some Katlang Topaz and the first few Shomar Bakur aquamarines. And I was planning my trips, but the best thing was when Google Earth appeared. 
I checked out every ridge in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Mark, where I thought there were good pegmatites. And there were some specimens that I had seen. They said, this is from Shigar Valley. And I looked, and they didn't correspond. And I wanted to find out where they came from. And I will show you quite a few pictures from this place. So this is what Pakistan looks like. Beautiful specimens, mostly aquamarine topaz, but I'll show you a few others. Here is uh, more, two morganites, an aquamarine tourmaline from Pakistan in my collection. And you all know where Pakistan is situated, I hope. Now, its border, we already had an uh, introduction, so it's similar. I took out, I didn't put anything of the ruby sapphire deposits that Richard already spoke about. So in principle, you have the Hindu Kush on this side, the Karakoram mountain range, and the Himalayas, and they're meeting right up here. And the most heavily mineralized for gems is right up here. And then, of course, we have plenty of regions where there, you know, a difficult territory between India and Pakistan. So I will take you into and start over here and go eastward. So when you reach up there, uh, you fly into Islamabad and you hope that there will be a flight to Gilgit or Skardu. And the first day when your flight is, you go in, you check in three security checkpoints, and then it's boarding, and you go to the boarding standing queue, and then you wait for another half an hour, and then, oh, flight is canceled, come back tomorrow. Then you have to take a taxi across town, and here is the Pakistan Airlines. Nothing is open. You have to go on the back side, and the 300 Pakistan is ahead of you to change their ticket. And my first time there, it happened five days in a row. And the fifth day, I was getting a pretty upset. I'm not easy to piss off, but you know, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was wondering, okay, where is, the, where is the airplane? Now it's the fifth day, I'm here to board. Oh, it's in Karachi. It's in Karachi, so why is it not taking off? Oh, the weather is so poor up in the northern areas. I called a friend in Gilgit, one in Skardu, blue, blue sky. It's been the whole week. So I said, okay, I rent a Jeep. I arranged with one guy to rent a Jeep in Peshawar, come and pick me up. And then I happened to go with another friend I just saw outside the airport. It's 30 hours drive on the Karakoram Highway. And when you get up there to northern areas, you'll see pegmatites everywhere. Right here to the right side, they're not so rich. Uh, well, the left picture on the right side, but that Haramosh mountain, they're extremely rich in uh, good pegmatites. Now, I called Pakistan after three, four hours on uh, Karakoram Highway, I called it land of Inshallah. Why? Because every other, every third turn, you risked its left-hand traffic, you have 2,000 feet down to the river, and you have more than 1,000 feet up, boulders coming down, uh, they don't even honk and they try to take over. You meet somebody, the road is gone partly. Herb here he has gone many times in money also, so uh, it's better to fly, in fact. Uh, <laughs> don't wait a week, to, it's better to fly. There's a new road nowadays uh, which is better. So, another thing that I was very lucky. In 1984, I had a, a student friend at university, he was a PhD student in mechanical engineering. He was from Pakistan, and I made friends with people from all over the place, tried to learn their languages a bit, and uh, it happened that he was going back to get married, okay, and I was wishing him luck, but he was lucky because his parents didn't choose the lady for him. He asked his parents if his, uh, his sisters could do that. He came back with the most wonderful lady, and when I was going to go down to Pakistan the first time, I invited them for dinner at my summer house, and I was flying out two days later. And she said, well, you should see my brother, okay. He's, he's colonel, colonel, he's responsible for the entire Gilgit district. How can you refuse that? So when I land in Islamabad, the first thing I hear, Mr. Peter, Mr. Peter, and here is this big general with, you know, <laughs> colonel with orders all over. He was waiting for me, smiling, waiting with the car, and we had a few hours to go for lunch before my next flight was. And uh, that was a very nice introduction to Pakistan. So anyway, we already saw the geological map how India drifted northward, collided with the Asian plate. And to the right here, you see the Nanga Parbat Haramosh Massive, uh, where you have quite a lot of pegmatites. The problem is from 8,000 meters on Nanga Parbat down to 5,000 meters is only ice. So on Haramosh Peak, you have a bit better chance to see something. Here, and here is Nanga Parbat from Haramosh. And 
the left picture is walking up on Mount Haramosh and really a Stone Age village. The first time ever I saw people living in complete Stone Age on the soil floor with just a fireplace, nothing else. And very friendly people. And here's typical Pakistani dealer with the material they have it shows. Now this one shows a bit better the topography, 24,000, 26,000, 28,000 feet. And all the deposits are located right in between those high peaks with very, very difficult terrain. On this photo, we will start at Chuma Bakor up in the northwest corner here, go down to Haramosh here, then Laila Peak, then we'll go to Shengus, Bulachi, we'll see Bulachi, then we go over to Skardo and Shigar Valley. We'll take a little look at some things from the Alpine clefts and then finish with the Shigar Braldu Valley. So this is Hunza Valley up north, and Shuma Bakur is up the valley to the left there. Here is a friend, Albert Schleilesch. Now he had taken the first picture of K2. He's collecting cores. He takes groups down to Pakistan for collecting. I have only traveled alone to Pakistan. I have never gone to mine with any Pakistani mineral dealer. I don't want to be involved in the, in the business. I'd rather just go and study and take pictures and put on a beard and put Pakistani clothes on. So this is an article I wrote about Shuma Bakor. Here is, you can see the high alpine terrain, the glaciers. You see the marking for Shuma Bakor. The problem there, it is very cold. They can only start digging out, shoveling out the snow in end of July from the tunnels. Then start mining. They usually start mining two in the afternoon because it's too cold before. Before lunch is too cold and they mine till two, three o'clock at night is what the mining camp looks like and the tunnels are in to the left there. Miners, very brave. I remember two, three years ago, I think it's three years ago, one miner called me from up on the mountain and he was just the last to leave. Minus 55 degrees. So, and you can imagine it's a long way before they had to carry everything down. It's a good 18 hours walk there. So now they have built a road uh, two-thirds up the mountain, which makes it easier, but it's still very strenuous. So here is uh, one friend almost at the top. Now, everybody thinks these are pegmatized. Those are not pegmatized. Those are more hydrothermal veins. It's more like Sio Baoding in China. Thin vertical fissures, very, very small. <coughs> Excuse me. Already in 1985, when I saw my first plates, I was looking, this it doesn't look like pegmatized. You saw the wall work was not. It was just a thin fissure filled with muscovite. Then whether you have beryl there or shiolite or cassitra, that's another story. So you see to the left here, very, very thin fissure, but they can be just a few millimeters and they follow them for 10 meters, 20 meters. And sometimes they open up. And this is the best and only great photo I've seen that Alfred took of a pocket because if you visit there, you usually don't see a pocket. There are 55 mining teams in 55 different tunnels. In the 80s, Early 90s, they would blast and they would happen to blast into the next tunnel. They had no coordination between the teams. So here they're trimming the pieces up on site. And these are good pieces, but you know, they're big clankers. They need to trim them down. They can't carry those boulders. Now I'll show you a typical lot, but a good year. About 300 miners, they bring everything down and then there are a few hundred uh, dealers from Peshawar who wants to have a chance and they bid on pieces and lots and so on. <coughs> Most of these in the early days had serious damage but I think by about 89, 90 they learned to take them out very carefully so they were very fast to learn. Here are two pieces, wonderful Spinello twin fluorite in Marcus Buda's collection. This is uh, Arkenstone, the aquamarine to the right. You can have a uh, flat spinel law twins with this small one with aquamarine. Big green fluorite, 20 centimeter. Uh, very rarely the aquamarine has a fairly good strong color. It's never as gemmy and well colored as it's in Haramosh and Shigar Valley, which will come to soon. And here is a big fluorite. And I heard the miners' description that when, when they found this, they brought it in front of the fireplace and sitting, eating, drinking, just looking at this thing. You know, so. uh, here is a nice matrix. Just across the valley from Shuban Bakor, there's a fikar. It's down to, a, it's a small pegmatite, but we have a bit longer aquamarines and very 
more reddish floor appetites. I didn't show you, but there are also nice floor appetites here. This is the first miner of Gilead. And now I will take you down to the locality which I found out by Google Earth. I saw all the pegmatites there. I said, I'm going there. So when I came down to the area, I spoke with the local, you know, the villagers, and I want to go up to this village above you. Down there, there were Sunni Muslims, and there were Shia up there that said, you can't go there. And finally, one mineral dealer said, he had said, I will bring you to any mine. He said, oh, my little brother will bring you. So I jumped in the car. His brother took me down to Indus River Valley. And he said, you walk from here. Oh, you're not coming along. Oh, no, they will shoot me when I cross the bridge here. There was a lot of fighting, and the U.S. Uh, foreign ministry and the British, they were warning, no foreigners should be there. And whatever you do, don't speak with any religious people, which is not so easy to avoid, but you have to try to do that. So Haramosh, you see a very high alpine terrain. Mount Haramosh is in the middle right. Big glaciers. The biggest glaciers outside the polar areas are in Pakistan. And this is Mount Haramosh Peak. So 24,000 feet. The best section is this, the western part. Here are good pegmatites, and here is ice covered. You can't see much here anyway. So I wanted to scan the ridges here. There are 50 mines here, 50 mines here, 50 mines here. So there are plenty of mines. But typically here, every 10 years, they find a pocket with one piece that is fantastic. That's the average. So very, very rarely. So where did I want to go? Can you guess? Uh, the mines are up here, and the very best mines are up on those pinnacles, right up at the top. I'm not a good mountaineer, but in fact, what you have to do, you have to climb up, and you have to rappel down. So in vertical cliff walls is where they're hanging, and some of these gentlemen, they're 70, 75 years old with beach shoes, you know, these flip-flop, uh, they don't even have uh, proper shoes on, and hanging, dangling up there, and it's minus temperature in the morning, and... Uh, you just sleep on the rock behind some cliff or something. It's quite amazing. So some of my friends, they think I'm crazy. You go alone. Some of my mineral friends, gem friends, say you go alone. Yes, I always go alone because it's too dangerous to bring somebody. I cannot guarantee somebody else's safety. I have managed to survive here, very dangerous situations, luckily. But I, I wouldn't recommend to go without doing very serious research about culture and so on first. So anyway, on the way up the mountain, I met a couple of miners. I've never seen them before. I don't speak Shina language that they spoke. I just knew a few words. And they were showing me I should not. I just spoke about mine and crystals. And they said, no, 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 you must not speak about this. Because first of all, even if you're Pakistani, you're not allowed to go to this mountain to see the mines. It's completely not allowed. Only the villagers from the mountain. So on every mountainside, the village that owns that mountain, they have all the rights. Nobody else is allowed to have, bring their goats there or pick minerals or even walk there. So what the villagers would be doing, in fact, over 100 years the villagers have been collecting. They've been traveling through India down to Delhi to exchange their aquamarines for salt. This was the tradition from this village. But this was completely unknown in the world. So I found this, and this uh, man here, as I was a traveler, uh, he invited me for dinner, and I just looked in the soup, and I thanked very much, but he gave me a couple of eggs, and he had a cow belly with water. I ran out of water. It was 48 degrees down below in Shangus, in the shadow. It was extremely hot. I had no idea it could be so warm up between those mountains. I could never imagine. And I, I asked them uh, whether it's water, Utsi Wei, it's spring water. And they pointed, yes, the Utsi Wei on the mountain. But they didn't tell me it was at 4,500 meters. There was not a single stream on the mountain. It was southwest face, absolutely no water. So uh, this miner, he was living here. The house to the right, his living quarters. And they got the goats and animals, a couple of small cows here. But very, very friendly people. So here is family. The girl to the left, Li Baba, is a cousin, but he has nine kids, half of them without shoes. Beautiful nature. They were growing plenty of food, corns, apricots here. So this is, this is just my beginning of the climb, this photo. And here is going up the first lowest pegmatites. And these two miners that I met on the mound, I've never seen them in my life before. They came with me. 
And they showed me, don't tell, we will tell our father he's minor, our uncles are minors, but you cannot tell them it's illegal. So there was a guard sitting a third way up the mountain with a big rifle across. One of the brothers went to give him an apple that we picked on the way up. And we just greeted him and continued. If he had known that I was a foreigner, they would stop me right there. This is what the pegmatite looked like. It looks uh, not, if you compare with many pegmatites of the world, these don't look like they're very interesting. And they barely have any barrel at all. You can see, next photo, there is a little frozen barrel. So those are extremely poor in pockets. Very, very poor in pockets. Shigar Valley has plenty of pockets, different. So this is when we got up and this is where we put camp and the mines are right about here. So you can see now here in this vertical cliff wall of the mine tunnels and this ridge is going up, 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 up and continuing way up to the right here. So this is in fact the lowest part of the best ridge. Here, the mountain in the background, 7,800 meter, Rakapushi, 25,000 feet. So, this is one of the best pieces ever found here. Probably the nicest small aquamarine, at least in, to my taste, in the world. But it was found right up at this pinnacle. And I will show you the next photo that we're climbing up here, and you will see what it looks like. And this is just fantastic, about seven centimeter, but it's, that's, for my taste, perfect one. So anyway, here is, uh, here is one mine up here, one here, one here, and that one came from right up that apex. They have drilled through this, so this is about ready to fall down, in fact, so that mine is finished. And here is a close-up of the mines. So when I got up there, one miner had cut his finger completely. It was swollen. Uh, what they do, they put chicken dung on to disinfect it. And I think, mm, better not to do that. I gave him antibiotics a week when I was up there. I told him, don't go down. With that heat down in the valley, he would have to amputate. And after a week, he was okay. So I put iodine solution on every day and, well, several times a day. Here is my brother to the left and a cousin. So the, the funny thing, I didn't tell you, but on the way up, I don't know Shina language at all. But if you walk for 12 hours with these miners up the mountain, you pick up something. So I made my first sentence on the way up, and they were laughing. So I told them, So somehow, from the language they were speaking, I managed to pick up, I could tell that you're my brothers from Haramosh. And after I was, they treat me as a member of their family, and still do. Uh, this is in the sunset, beautiful. The first few nights, I just... They wanted me to sleep in their small caves behind rocks and so on. They pulled up, the, you know, they put up some rocks and some pieces of wood. I just slept right up on the, there was a small, one small spot of grass with a drop off on the three sides. And one Sunday, one, uh, one night, I woke up of a very strong earthquake. So my sleeping bag slid off the, I don't know what you call it, the cover. Uh, in fact, I slid off the whole thing. It was quite strong. And the earthquake, I felt in Tucson a couple of times, but it was just vibrating very, very low frequency. You barely know if it's an earthquake. This one was shaking sideways. That's the only time I saw. I would just shook off the... So this is the sunset up there. And one night it was raining. Then I crawled into a cave. Haramoshin, I call this place. So here is looking down. When I got up there, I asked, where is Utsi Way? Well, it's down. So it was down the next valley. I had to go down a few hundred meters. And I, I had been eating antibiotics because when I get down there, I had to five, five uh, days delay in Islamabad, another 30 hours uh, bus, uh, well, jeep ride. And then you had to discuss with the villagers for several days before they would allow you to continue across the river to the next village. So not so easy. So I already lost two weeks on my way to the mines, and I had three main targets that first time. So uh, by accident, they gave me water from the Nala, from the local stream, and I became very sick, fever, two days, I took antibiotics, and the third day I climbed up this mountain, and I felt like I was 100 year old. I would have never managed to climb up unless there was a pegmatite up there, really. <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> Uh, I, was, uh, I was only reading the instruction. It said you should not, uh, you feel drowsy, because when I was climbing, when it came to vertical cliff walls and it was very hot, 
I felt like really dizzy, and then you climb five more minutes, and you're dizzy for a few seconds to 30. You just needed to hang on to the. So it wasn't the best. I should have waited a couple of more days, but I hadn't read the instruction on these antibiotics. <laughs> so here is, if you ever see me at a mineral show, walking hand in hand with a Pakistani man, probably I would never do with another man, but it means that you're a very good friend. They treat you as one of their absolute dearest friends. And at mineral shows in Munich, I had three Pakistani guys do this to me. They grab your hand and walk happily down. That's extremely a big honor if they do that. And here I came up and one of the miners grabbed my hand. So just to show you a bit, the color is very good in Haramosh. This one is a bit weaker. Aqua from Haramosh, uh, these other from other places. Um, they, and they don't fade as quickly as from Shigar Valley. You know, uh, this color, as uh, George uh, Rossman already been speaking about uh, the colors of uh, minerals, uh, radiation induced. So you don't expect to find dark colored smoky quartz here. The pegmatites, they're only 10 million years old. So you don't expect to find heliodors. But if you go to pegmatites, they're 100 million years old, 200, 300, yes. The same with tourmalines. Here you would expect to find very lightly colored pink tourmalines. There are some locations where you can find deeply pink, but that's not typical. So that's digging one pocket. Here are some more. You see the pigment that looks like nothing. Nice aquamarine, shirl, beautiful shirl. Here are two pieces the topaz my brother collected. Interesting garnets. And here's another aqua that my brother collected. Fantastic. But in that pocket, all the other small crystals look like nothing special. One beautiful, beautiful. It's a thin crystal, but beautiful color. And here's topaz. This is Barry Kitts' uh, topaz, I know now. And I think I'm going to show this to one of my brothers, Asim, who found it. Because when I got there a couple of years earlier, he had found a big pocket with one big, with four crystals on, a couple with one on. So this might very well be. And here you see uh, one that was in Herb's uh, collection once upon a time, a small one, belongs to Anton Wasser, but you see, look at that picture, Albert Russ, he takes beautiful mineral photography with all the detailed surface. What is interesting here in Haramosh, high up by the mines, there are snow leopards, there are, um, what do you call the peacocks also, peacocks living high altitude, I could never imagine. In Nepal they live down in the forest, here they live high up on the mountain by the glaciers. Here's a snow leopard. And here is uh, Sassi. So now we're going, as I showed on the map, now we're going eastward. <coughs> Sassi village is like a baking oven. Shengus is even worse. It was 48 degrees when I started down here. So on the Sassi side, here are many, many pegmatite, but it, it really is a long way to go up. And a little bit further here comes Staknala, but we will go on the back side first to Laila camp. Okay, sorry, we're still in Haramosh. So when I, when I got down that first, here is my family, my father and his, well, my uncle. And I sat and cooling because it was too hot for me. I sat in this ice cold water 45 uh, minutes. And the funny thing, this is years and years ago. And last year I heard from a couple of packs that you are so brave. And what is that? Oh, they're speaking about you so much in Haramosh. Okay, what are they telling? You are a completely strong man. You sat in this ice water so long. <laughs> but it was just with my feet and I was splashing all the time. But for them, they would never even dop their toe in it. <laughs> so anyway, without speaking their language, body language helps a lot. And I don't know, still don't know Shina, but uh, after a few years, we were speaking on Skype. They have an uncle at the university in Gilgit. So they couldn't believe the first time they saw me on a computer because they're illiterate, but they know how to calculate. Strangely enough, in this village, Everybody literate, but they could count very good. So, miners, what is this guy doing? <laughs> anyway, here's my, my little baby son and my brother on the right photo. Here is a uh, nice hydroxyl herdrite and raising hay. The funny thing, the men in this uh, village, they had flowers in their hair often, decorated themselves. Now here just had the, the grass. And the women, they were open and playing music and dancing, so completely different. Down in the valley, across the river, there were burkas. Women, as soon as the car was coming on the road, they would turn against the stone wall. They are not allowed to look in the direction of a car because it's only a man who drives a car. So anyway, on the Kaltaro Glacier behind, 
there is an emerald deposit, and this is a pegmatite also with big emerald crystals, and there are a couple of pockets in another pegmatite which are bicolored. It's not from Shigar Valley, this is, it has been labeled. And here is up uh, Haramoshla. So the mountain pass is 5,400 meter. You need to go over to go down to Lila Peak, as you can see here. There are some beautiful magnetites, the lazulite, the best lazulite crystals in the world. The biggest was 790 gram, and here's Lila Peak. And it's my friend's father who discovered this long time ago. He collected all the first, and here are the fissures uh, with short terminals up to eight centimeters, very steep termination. Usually they're loose uh, uh, pieces. And here is a man who discovered the place. And here is one example of the beautiful last light. So there are also beautiful magnetite, uh, and in fact, several other mineral species right here. Now we're going down to Shengus. So we're going down Shengus, then Stagnala shortly. Alpine clefts are up in Tormic, and in this region then comes aquamarine mines. Tormic, uh, one of the best localities, they haven't been mining because it's so full of snakes. This alpine cleft is just chock full of snakes. So here is down in Shengus by the Indus River Valley. You see hundreds and hundreds. In fact, there are over, you know, there are several tens of thousands of pegmatites just in this region between Haramosh and Shigar Valley. And I was asked to edit a paper by the Pakistan Geological uh, Survey for Arab uh, Journal of Geology. And um, I could see from, I encouraged them to study more because they had only taken samples along the road down in the valley. But the, from 2000 or 1500, 2500 meters, the pegmatites go way up to 5000 meters and they're really interesting and they, they should study them for 20 years or so from now on. Here you can see down by the Indus River, uh, they're pegmatized there, they're mining here. It's very tricky because in fact here is verinonite coming from these mines and the water suddenly goes above the mines, very dangerous. The verinonite here is usually corroded, so not so good, but very difficult. So miners, they send me pictures, and even if I, I don't buy, I, I buy one crystal, I don't need this, but they send pictures like this. And what do you say? We just want $150,000. Okay, but I'm not interested. <laughs> but then they send you a second photo. It looks better. <laughs> and then comes this photo. And then comes this photo. The one to the right I never saw. This was Fine Minerals International. It's in MIM Museum now. But I got the picture of the guy with the left hand. But for these three, they wanted also $40,000. So I never bought anything like that. Uh, here is another. What is interesting, if you look about regional geology and uh, Pegmatites, uh, George was speaking about, well, in fact, um, uh, about how old the oldest uh, gem deposits are. So most are five, 600 million years old. In Finland, Ukraine, we have those that are 1.6, 1.7 billion years old, but they're very rare. And here they're very, very young, and really you have an extreme fractionation of cesium minerals, lithium minerals, and here is a beautiful aquamarine, the propeller from the Span collection. It's across the river from Shengus. It's they call this the White Mountain locally, and there you have triplet of gem quality in this region also. Beautiful garnets. You have beautiful goshenites that they irradiate, and they come out on plates with smoky cores, and they're blue blue. They're almost like lapis blue. These aquamarines, and they name them. They label them from Badakhshan, transparent, stout, <coughs> rather short prismatic. Here is natural morganite. The premier. If it goes through a few, I saw this in Pakistan, this piece, this morganite. And uh, so we came out of Shengus. And then it goes through a few guys in Pakistan, ends up in the USA, and it's from Paprock, Afghanistan. So it's a bit uh, tricky with specimens. Here is Staknala that was found a long time ago. In 85, they were starting producing uh, quite a big numbers, 89, 90. You could buy in some of the hotel rooms in Tucson a sheet with 2,000 specimens on. Average price was not bad at all, but uh, I didn't have a need for those money. So here is Stagnala, typical specimen. The more colorful ones can be like this. The shirl on Topaz is the only one I ever saw like that. Hamburgite, fantastic, and Fine Minerals International, and uh, the Morganite on Tourmaline. Topaz on Tourmaline, Fluorite on Tourmaline. <coughs> Excuse me. So Stagnala, we will go to Shigar Valley. 
So this is what Chigal Valley looks. Uh, most of the parts are up by the glaciers. Some are down here. And we'll look at some alpine cleft material. Many quartz <coughs> with beautiful inclusions. Uh, Viktor Tuslokov is a fantastic gem cutter from uh, Russia. He lives in Bangkok now. He cut this. In fact, he sent me that photo just two days ago. 1,415 carats he cut, so I have the crystal to the left and that egg. He spent two months cutting it, two months of work. In Churkanala, three years ago, they found this fantastic axonite. This was one of the two best floor appetites from nearby. Clean and zoocyte. Epirotes, like Knappenwand, up to 30 centimeters, the longest I've seen. But I cannot show everything. <laughs> so, but the alpine clefts here, they have a lot of minerals. There are alpine clefts on the western side toward the border to Afghanistan also. I can show you everything. Here's more Shiga Valley. A good aquamarine pocket, a really good with good color will look like this. But you see most of it is for carving and cabochons and jewelry and there's some gemmy crystals. But this is very good. So to find a piece like this is exceedingly rare. There's maybe one or two found per year. But now you have to remember there's 100,000 miners. So somebody says, oh my God, they want 70,000 for this or 150,000. Well, imagine what you would have to pay 100,000 miners. I don't have anything for this for sale, but just to give you a reflection, you know, uh, this was a dream pocket, you could say. Look, with the topaz and good colored aquamarine, but they were not together on the same specimen, which does occur here in Chigar Valley, but very rare. This piece I saw also many years ago down in Chigar uh, when I just was there, and now it's Scott Rudolph collection. Here is a fantastic old piece from Teston, and little kid playing. This aquamarine was for sale here now, I know, in Rob's gallery still. Beautiful. Herb had that one some years ago. And a beautiful one with the helix inside this location. There are also fluorides, there are hydroxyl herdrides. But some of these pockets, one, they sent me pictures and films from mining, only quartz. Finally, they found a one and a half meter long goshenite crystal. But they didn't know what to do with it. They rolled it down the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so here is a rare combination. Nice aquamarine, Mark Mothner photo. And uh, Videnski, one topaz with smoky quartz. Now, if the topaz get deeper color like these, they are irradiated from Shiga. They don't, if they go even more brown, so I'm not too interested in that. And the triple I see very gemmy. I donated two such gemmy to the museum in Vienna, the first two that I saw come out years and years ago. Here's a rare Gwindel quartz uh, with aquamarine. And now we go down to the very <coughs> converging. Here it's easy to travel with the car unless you uh, drive too late in the morning then you have water crossing, rivers crossing. So I came here to this cliff and they had just started mining and I said why do you go 2,000 meter further up or why don't you mine here year round and they did that and after it started to look like this. You see they have mined all the way. So I said here are plenty of people. mine here year round you don't have to climb up and stay a week and come down and they found this specimen there. Gino knows this piece. <laughs> if I hadn't told them, maybe still they wouldn't be mining there. <laughs> so I saw the photo of this when it came out. It didn't look very much. It was all covered and dirty. Hydroxyl herd right. Here is a recent find a few years ago. Cleaned up, looks like this. Big topaz, very rare, the size of topaz, and in very nice aquamarine. And this is one fantastic piece in Boodle's collection. Hydroxyl herd right and single crystals. Now, when you're down there, you look like this. You need to put on a beard. And this is the first aquamarine. I told you 100,000 miners. 40,000 miners did a strike one time. Now, I come to one interesting thing here. Shangri-La is a beautiful hotel between the mountains. I was going to fly home, and I had to wait two, three days to my flight. Finally, the Minister of Justice was staying at my hotel, and then there was a flight, even if the flight wasn't full. But there was still eight hours to the flight, so I went to Shangri-La Hotel. There was nobody there, no tourists, because it was too dangerous. So we asked if we could have lunch. Yeah, sure, we, you can have lunch. And we sat down, the lunch was just served, and my minor friend and the taxi driver just disappeared. I thought they went to the restroom. I had already been washing my hands, so that's... And suddenly came an elderly gentleman, 75 maybe, with a long beard, and the younger one with the long beard, and start an interrogation, 74, oh, 45 minutes, very serious, and then another two hours. 
So how can you influence us with what you're here? Is it dangerous for foreigners to be here? What do you think about the woman's situation in Pakistan? Well, woman's situation, same as my mother. She was home, she was growing vegetables, which is true. I didn't say anything, everything was true. If it's dangerous for, yes, yeah, dangerous for everybody, so much earthquakes and you know, glaciers are dangerous and stones falling down, so everything. And <clears throat> how I can influence, I'm a guest of your country. So, of course, I'm not here to influence you. That's, that's not the purpose. So, I will show you the last uh, three deposits. Kashmir, they're termalines along the border to India. And then, a little further south, you f a few years ago, they found these incredible peridotes. Just unbelievable. Some with magnetite, and this is one of the best pictures of these. And already in 1972, Near Peshawar, on the Katlang Hill, Gundau Hill near Katlang, they found in beautiful pink topaz crystals. There are two generations of calcite veins, so no pegmatites, and in the more tan color ones, this incredible color is found. And here is a piece from the Span collection. So, of course, when it comes to all these crazy travels, you are encouraged by your family when you're a kid, by friends here, by Herb, who went there many years before I went. So I want to thank all of you, and we have to transmit it to our new generation. This is my son, one-year-old collecting, and with an aquamarine. So thank you very much.